And well, in a way, I grew up with many women, and mother, aunties, and grandmothers, and neighbors, and I always was impressed at the fact that in a very macho society, uh, machista, we say, uh, you understand machista society, a society kind of ruled and managed by men, I think the women, even though they are not in the front, they are always uh, kind of constructing the fiber of the society in the background. So I was really interested in women's cinema. I love the female characters of Casabes, the films of Fassbinder, and all these films where women have a, a very interesting and complex role. So what I tried to do during this process is um, work with women, and I wanted also to talk about time. And the only way of talking about time is talking with, about uh, an older group of women that are also questioning everything that happened in their life. So this is kind of the protagonist, um, uh, that, that's where they come from. And also questioning uh, at the same time what happened with the history of my country. I was trying to ask uh, questions more than find answers in the film. And I think it was the only way of doing it for me. Uh, this is an everyday, everyday, everyday life uh, history. We usually don't take seriously the possibility of heroism and good stories in everyday life. What aspects of everyday life attracted you to this story? Um, I felt that uh, everyday life is full of um, cinema when you look at it from a distance. I mean, sometimes I look at films that are strong about uh, death, about rape, about suffering for love or whatever, but I think we suffer every day and we love every day and we feel a lot of things in the, in the everyday life that are uh, overlooked many times because um, we, we naturalize them. And I wanted to talk about this, um, uh, the life of these women that um, when you look at them from a distance, it, it, it makes you realize that this probably shouldn't be that naturalized, that you can uh, rethink many ways of seeing your own life uh, with a small distance. What I like here is that there is least, less discussion of political issues in this film compared to the similar works. Society is apparently accepted the characters and their sexual orientation. In this sense, in this sense it is, a, I think, a post-political movie. Do you agree with this comment? A political movie. Post-political. Uh, a post-political movie. Okay, thank you. That's nice. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it is... Um, we wanted to make a film that looks at the future. We, want, we were sure that we didn't want to make... We wanted to look at the past, but with a future in our hearts. I mean, of course, uh, the characters uh, don't feel comfortable with their sexuality. You feel that through the film. But I didn't want to put them in a position where they had to fight for, food, for who they are but just is a character that are probably not that comfortable in their own skin. And of course also, I mean, the, the cinema in many ways have been showing too much for me. Uh, when there is a film about two women that love each other, they would insist on bad scenes and all this way of looking at the relationship. And I thought for me it was more interesting to, because I come from a very repressed society where pudor is a key. Uh, in understanding the way we behave, uh, I thought only Pudor was the way to tell this story uh, better. So, of course, I, I like the definition of post political mainly because I agree with you. Many times, political is used as marketing, but many times, exotism, exotic film, you know, show your trees, show your rivers, and we will love it. And that's a big problem with fans, with festivals, with producers, with critics, many times. And I think uh, the the idea behind all the team of this film was let's show what we want to show and we, let's make the film we believe in and try to finance it. And that was a huge challenge and I think uh, being in Berlin with the film is uh, great for us just mainly because we did that. Can you tell more about the Borgia family uh, most women from? Uh, what was the source of for the life. Uh, well, Paraguay has like a 5% of elite that lives and looks, I don't want to say look down, but of course they feel superior to the rest of the country. And I think in many ways I wanted to put these women in a moment where economically they're losing that position, but they still have to fake it. 
So you see that they belong to a family where they inherited a lot of uh, furniture, a house, a car, but they also inherited prejudice, they inherited constraints. So in a way, I think the heresy refers to all this inheritance. Uh, on, the, on, uh, on the one hand, a society that wants to reproduce itself, wants to keep being an, uh, an elite, but at the same time losing this privilege makes these women question where they are, you know, where they are now. They, one of them goes to prison and have to interact with inmates, which is something that uh, they would never do. They would never interact with that much with another social class unless one of them goes to prison. And also the touch, you know, in the film, the, as soon as Chiquita goes to prison, uh, they start uh, the guards touching, the inmates touching, the maid touching, so they start being touched. And I thought that was also a way of uh, portraying what is happening in that moment when you still belong in your fantasy to this social class, but then the rest is surrounding you and is touching you. The relationship uh, between emancipation and car ownership. The woman felt relief after having access to the car. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, that that was in a in a way uh, the car allow us to to give her uh, a tool that she also, in a very obvious comparison, start driving her life. So in a way that was, uh, the car was almost like a character that gave her in many ways uh, freedom, in many ways the possibility of uh, moving forward and also the, the, the possibility of taking with her, uh, of having a job and also um, starting to make decisions uh, by herself. And of course her partner said, you shouldn't be driving, you don't have a license. And of course, uh, the car is the first thing they sell when Chiquita comes back from the, or they are about to sell when Chiquita comes back from the prison. And how do you think of uh, the ending of the film? Do you think, is it open or closed ending? Uh, I think it's an open ending in many ways because uh, we know these characters who in a, in a way uh, is released but we give her the opportunity of doing what she wants. I wanted the film and many points during the script process, I wanted the film to finish with her in prison because I felt my country is still uh, trapped, but then uh, it was hard for me to also through the process of discovery and working with the characters, uh, discover that it was also the possibility of open doors, open windows, escaping. So this was something I learned through the process of the film, and I feel it gives the film uh, some brief the end. Uh, you picked a fascinating set of female cast for the film, mostly non-actors. How did you pick them? How was the um, I picked the main uh, characters, Chiquita and Chela, about one year before starting shooting the film. So we had opportunity to rehearse, and I needed a lot of rehearsal, more than they did, because I needed to know if the film was working, the dialogues were working, and I wanted to incorporate them. I mean, Pupé is really the nickname of uh, Chela. I mean, that's how her uh, grandchildren call her. So in many ways, I wanted to, uh, in a way, work with them, have the time, and, the, and, and the, to understand their pace, and to understand if they really could make uh, these characters. So casting was casting, it was small, I didn't cast a lot of people, but I knew that uh, Anna Brun, for example, that come from theater, but very little theater, she has done very few things and uh, Chiquita comes from 50 years of a lot of theater. So they could kind of balance each other in the way they needed to perform in the film. Anna Ivanova comes from a lot of uh, recent, she posts nude for artists, she does a lot of performance and a lot of short film with students and some future films as well. So in a way, um, it was a combination, I think, that make it work. And also the rehearsals, I believe rehearsals. Uh, sometimes it's more difficult for people like Anna Brun that she gets tired easily because she's not used to it. But for, for example, Margarita Irun, in order to find her character, she needed a lot of rehearsal. And Anna Brun, sometimes her first take was perfect, and then she made everything different in every take. But the way she worked, which I found very interesting, was that she looked at everyone in the room and just asked me, what's my relationship to him, to her, to her? And with this in, brain, in her brain, she came to the scene and sometimes forgot her lines, but her performance was so organic because she knew exactly what she was feeling for each character in the room. And I find that fascinating. I also learned from them a lot. Okay. And uh, you rigorously controlled the focus. 
how was the working relationship with DOP? Uh, well, I have worked with Luis Santiago for 10 years now, so we know each other very well, and all, whenever he reads something, he always has a proposal. So Luis did a lot of research in order to find the right mood for the film, and we discussed it, uh, many things that were strong for me in the writing process, were that I wanted to shoot the film from inside a door, you know, a kind of half open doors and give the film all this uh, obscurity. And Luis is very good at capturing that and making it better. You know, he has this uh, talent and ability. And I really think we took the time also. We shot during 40 days. And sometimes the producers, which are nearby now, say, Oh, you need to, you can make this film in 30 days. And of course you can make it, but it will be a different film. I mean, we got to the set and we really discussed. Why do we put the camera here? And we had a lot of argument, and out of that fusion, kind of the film comes out. Mm -hmm.